Hi, my name is Steven Rich. I'm a 3D artist over here at Red5 Studios, and today I'm going to show you how we integrated Substance Designer 4 into our pipeline uh, for the game Firefall. Um, it has been an uh, incredibly powerful tool and has helped speed and save up so much of our time, um, along with keeping uh, coherency between our texture works. And that was the whole th reason why uh, we looked into doing this. Um, our characters are already com complex. We have all kinds of different backpacks, all different kinds of upgrades, all different kinds of weapons. Uh, and so we were having a problem with uh, coherency between uh, each one, and it was a very time-consuming task to go back and color sample through Photoshop and try to match materials, match different grunge layers, and all that. So when we saw sub Substance Designer, we knew that there was going to be something there. We did exactly that, and we picked it up, and we started working with it. Um, and this is just a small example of uh, what we're doing with it with it currently um, basically what we've done is we've taken different nodes um, and created a giant template uh, just like you guys have seen algorithmic with their car template and their gun former template and their gun template uh, just imagine those just at a very much larger scale um, and far more complex um, in the terms of how many buttons and sliders and uh, situations they can handle um, and so we're pretty much making uh, one of these giant nodes per race, per class, per uh, use, basically. So currently we're going to go over uh, the Accord template today. I'm just going to show you a little bit of, of what it does um, and how we use it. Um, so as you see, uh, we have a Dreadnought here. Uh, and this Dreadnought's already using uh, seven different textures between the helmet and the upgrades and her basic battle frame um, and the backpack. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, and you see over here in the in the resources, you'll see each uh, different uh, node that we're using, but they're all running off of the same master node. Um, so what we did is we started with um, taking PBR our basic PBR values because uh, we already had a very small library of PBR because uh, a few years ago our characters switched to PBR, um, and we took those values and we put them in a very basic graph um, that is just as I said just the base value so it's going to give you your roughness your metallics um, a slider to change your diffuses and things like that so that was a good starting point um, so now utilizing this this already gives us a, a great graph that will already give us all of our base things to start with uh, as you see here um, if we go ahead and look at our texture you know we already have our roughness um, our metallic, uh, we have anastropic, uh, so this is our anastropic map, um, and there's the material map, um, or the selection map that we uh, already use that our engine reads to know what cube maps and things like that to uh, put on shaders. So using those colors that already existed, um, we just attach them to each different type of material, um, and then put them on a blending node that can be expanded later on as we decide to uh, add more. Uh, materials. So right now, like this is our metal area, so right now we have five different metals. Say we decide that we need a different type of metal, you know, we can add it, we can expand it, and just add it to our pipeline. Um, so this was the first graph that, that was created. Um, and right here, this already speeds up our process. The way it currently works for us is we would take our M-map, uh, we'd make it, uh, and we'd run it through our own uh, program uh, that would then spit out each individual map and then you take the maps you put them into to Photoshop and then you'd run it into the game and take a look at you know what your basic materials were going to look like well this now takes out all of the middleman and now we can actually look at what we're doing at the same time as we're selecting the colors that we're going to be using um, and different materials so we can we can break up things much easier uh, so that was the first and and really the the simplest thing for this uh, was creating this, even though this took me quite some time to figure out <laughs> exactly how to do it. Um, once it once it happened, um, it opened up a gateway. So now we can take this, and we, and we already have all of our base material. So when we go to make a chosen version, we just start from here uh, and we add everything. Um, so after this node, we went into uh, a little bit more complex, and we actually start uh, started making all the different filters that we would need. Um, so different grunges, uh, different dirts, different edge paint chips, things like that. Um, and so uh, 
I wrote a few of our own, or not wrote, it's not coding. <laughs> we, I created a few of our own. And one of the toughest things uh, when doing this, because I see a lot of people ask questions on the forums and things like that, like how do you make your own mass generators and things like that. The most important thing to ask is how do I get what I'm looking for when it comes to the selection? You just need to think in black and white. And and it took me a while, and it, it, it wasn't until Jeremy came and visited the office to, to help me out with all of this that it finally clicked that, oh, this is all just about figuring out how to get the selection. So if I want this certain type of edge, how do I get that? Like, is it through a levels adjustment? Is it the midtones? You know, do I need to do a histogram scan? Things like that. And by doing that and thinking in that way, um, it opened up the gateway to create all these. And after he, he came and visited and kind of clicked, I was just creating these custom masking nodes left and right. Um, so this is where they're all filtering in into a, a master filter. Um, let me make it bigger. I should have done this probably beforehand so we can see them a little bit easier. Um, so this is where all of the nodes that are the special effects node basically come in, filter in um, to create the main filter node that is then plugged into whatever uh, filter you're going to be using it in. And, and like I said, in this case, this is uh, mainly used for the Accord currently, but it can always be expanded on. Uh, another thing to note when you're doing this, especially in a production sense, um, if you guys notice, I do a lot of these boxes with frames and, and notes. Right now, I'm the only one working on this, but if anyone else ever needs to pick this up or take a look into what I'm doing or want to expand upon it at work, you want to make sure that people can do that and do it easily. Um, and so I have notes, you know, uh, in here. And when I talk about filter nodes, nodes, uh, one of the best things you can do is uh, add notes while you're moving along, um, so that uh, you know what to go back to to make controls for um, and functions. So, like in this case, this is our specular edges. So this is only going into your roughness and metallic map. Um, and this is just going to give all the, the poppy highlights on the edges of the armor. And for some other reason, this isn't calculating. Um, I'll take a look at that in a second. Um, you'll get your specular highlights uh, through this. So just edge chips and, and things like that. That's only in the spec, so just to add a little little bit of a pop to the edges uh, which was something we already did in our textures and that was the one of the toughest things was to translate what we've done for five years in Photoshop I then had to take all that knowledge and try to translate it into functional nodes that aren't overly restrictive yet restrictive enough to keep the purpose of the template um, and to keep the cohesion um, so if we go ahead and Let's uh, open, let's say, the first one. So this is actually an effects node. I know it looks like one of the blending nodes, um, but in this one's case, this is our base paint overlay. Um, and what I did here, let's go ahead and expose, oops, open reference, excuse me, um, is uh, I put it into two blending nodes because I wanted two different effects um, out of this node. I wanted to be able to control scratches and make them very shiny, and I wanted to make a little bit of dirt in there, just a little bit of dirt chip noise. Um, just a little tooth in, in the paint. So I wanted two different controls. So as I was talking about earlier, uh, if you see here, I made notes while I was moving along. Like, okay, this is going to be the scratch intensity. So this is where scratches are overlaid. Um, and I attach that to the opacity, slide that down uh, to help knock back scratches. Um, but the key thing is, is to make those notes so you can come back and remember that, oh yeah, this was the point of this node, or I put this node here for this purpose. And a lot of these nodes, as you see, don't have notations. Because um, the other thing you can fall into, or the other trap you can fall into, is adding too many controls. You're like, oh, I can I can add a levels here and add a contrast adjustment here. And then it just becomes overwhelming, and you have too many buttons that actually end up doing the same thing. A lot of the times I'll make one of these and come back and take out a lot of this stuff. So like here, we have the scratch scale, uh, which is on a transform. This is to help... Uh, you know, if you need finer scratches or larger scratches, um, you know, simple dirt overlays, things like that. And then they all come into the material color node um, that Substance Designer uh, has in it. Uh, in this case, I did change it a little bit and I added an overlay node in there and a, a soft light and a hard light. Um, so if you notice, it does say R5S on it because it was changed a little bit more into uh, some things that I thought maybe we'll end up using uh, in the future. Um, and again, so 
that was, you know, for dealing with the bright uh, things, so the scratches, which, you know, when you have paint, you want it to be scratched. Um, so you want it to be bright. Uh, and then I wanted to add a little bit of the darker noise and dirt. Um, and so that was the second note that I integrated. And then I created all the functions uh, to create it into the one note that you saw up here. Um, so basically, this is where a lot of your time comes from. Um, a little bit of, of advice when you first are making your base materials, if you're going to be making a template of this extent, like this has 17 materials in it, um, one of the first major problems I ran into when I first did this is that I put all the information in each material node. Um, so I was like, oh, this is how chrome is going to look. So I made the chrome look a certain way and I added certain tooth and noise to it. And then I was like, oh, this is how matte paint is going to look. And I added a bunch of tooth and noise. Uh, this made the node pretty much unusable. There was so much l input lag um, as it tried to calculate everything that there was just too much. And in fact, things just became overly complex and it just didn't really make sense. So. I scrapped it. I took it all out and just went with base colors and then just made our overlays run everything. And that's really, if you think about it, the way it's going to be when you're in a production line or, or when you're building something, it's not going to have all that tooth and stuff. You're going to paint it. The damage is going to be the same across the whole thing. Each thing doesn't need damage. You know, the dirt is going to be the same across the whole object when it gets dirty. Um, so by going back and, and and taking all that out, A, sped up tenfolds on, on the usability, uh, but also helped um, create a better look overall. Um, I would like to look at why our battle frame went out of res. So it looks like we have a, a slight input problem, probably when I adjusted something uh, in the other graph, and that's one thing to, to note is uh, sometimes this one small change can uh, can affect multiple graphs. When you're dealing with this, you have to be very careful because if I break one node, it's going to break many templates. Um, so in, in this case, anything that's using this this filter currently could become broken, uh, potentially. Um, and it has been a, a problem a few times uh, with us working. Let's go ahead and change that back to relative to parent. Hopefully that'll that'll fix the problem. Uh, so that was just one example of, of one of the mini nodes. Uh, and as you see, this does get a little bit disorganized. I try to stay as organized as possible. Uh, but sometimes you just have stuff going everywhere. I also found try to limit yourself to how many types of textures you're going to be using. Uh, in this case, uh, if you go back to our battle frame, you'll notice that everything is done uh, with four maps, uh, four very basic maps. Um, and it, it can be very easy to be like, oh, well, I'm going to make a direction map, and I'm going to make, you know, uh, a world space normal, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to create all these cool effects. And then you're just generating too many maps, um, in my opinion, um, that uh, you got to question if, if it's, if it's going to be worth that amount of space uh, and, and usage. Um, so uh, for our gun template that I created, that one does have an additional uh, map, and that does have a, a directional map input, um, and that's because uh, I added nodes that do brushed metal, um, and because of that, uh, so really the the workhorse is going to be uh, your filters um, and the effects you're going to be using. Also remember that uh, when you're combining them, uh, let's go back to the filter hub real quick. Um, as you as you go down the list, they're going to stack on top of each other. So as you can see, dirt. Uh, so I have cloth, but I have my my dirt effects, um, which is similar to the uh, paint one I just showed you. The dirt effects is is down here at the bottom, and because that's going to overlay over everything, because I want the dirt over the chips and things like that. And if you go up here to the top, you'll notice that the specular edges, uh, the damage, uh, like the the things I wanted to be. Uh, more shiny, so metal damage and things like that are at the top, uh, because I wanted that to happen first, basically, um, and then have everything else start overlaying and multiplying on top of that. Um, so that's the basic node. Uh, let me just run you through uh, basically how it's used. Um, so if we go back to our basic battle frame here. Now let's go ahead and start a new graph. File, new substance. Alright, we can just simply drag and drop 
the master template in here. So the next uh, step after you create all this is to create all the but buttons and functions uh, that are going to control it all. And that's where a lot of uh, your power is going to come from and also sometimes the, the confusion for it. Um, because you might add too much or uh, you might make it overwhelming. And that's currently what we're going through right now is we're we're removing buttons that we're notice, noticing are, are not needed or uh, that uh, that are giving too many controls um, for something that, again, is supposed to help unify. So let's say we're, we're working on our basic battle frame. We'll just go ahead and delete this. Okay, so let's just start with the basic node. Um, so a really cool feature, especially when you're dealing with nodes like this uh, with just a, a massive template node, you can just go right-click it, go down to Create, output nodes and you'll get all of your outputs then you're gonna go ahead and grab your whatever resources you're gonna link in nice thing uh, about linking uh, from Photoshop is you can just go into the Photoshop layer change that layer save it as the same name um, in that layer uh, and then it'll update in substance designer it makes iteration really fast um, and that's the amazing part and now with the new function that substance designer just came out with with being able to create a PSD and save out as a PSD with layers in Substance Designer, it's it's amazing um, what they're doing and and the the doorways they're opening uh, when it comes to streamlining uh, pipelines and making things faster. So if we go ahead and open our Dreadnought, we'll take our basic maps here. So the basic maps that we use here, this is our emissive map. So this is just dictating where the emissives are. And we have our AO, a normal map, and then our material map. Our material map uh, is just dictating where all the materials are. Uh, this could also be known as an SVG node. Uh, in this case, as I said, we've already been using uh, a similar system, so we just took our existing M maps and our colors um, and just translated them and plugged them into Substance Designer. So we just go through here and go ahead and plug all these in. Now, if you notice, we're at a really low milliseconds right now. This number is going to jump up. Um, and one of the most powerful things you can use when making templates and trying to save time uh, when it comes to calculating speed, this might even help for runtime speed, I don't know, is making switches. Uh, something Jeremy mentioned right before uh, at the end of our, our meeting when he was, was helping me out um, was switches, and they have been an absolute savior uh, when it comes to speeding up um, what we're doing. So, as you see, our, our runtime speed is already jumping up uh, because our texture size has changed. So, here goes the basic maps. So, as I said, uh, it's going to give you all the basics first. There's no information here. You just have War Paint White, which is the exact uh, 80, 85 to 87 range. Uh, white color that all battle frames are, uh, backpacks, anything character related that's going to be war painted because then we take the colors that you select, the colors, the skins that you earn and purchase, um, we then take those and we overlay those colors on top of your battle frame, um, thus changing the color of your battle frames. Um, so this is basically the starting point. We'll go ahead and drag and drop this new graph so we can see what's going on onto our dreadnought. So, as you see, nothing amazing yet. Alright, so let's go ahead and click the node, and here goes where all the magic happens. So now we have all the tools, and buttons, bells, and whistles um, that control all this. So, first off, you have some basic basic uh, tools. Let's say you needed to do some edits on the diffuse in Photoshop. Uh, so you don't want the AO information that you see in here, and you don't want like the cavity information. So I just added, like I was talking about switches, I added a switch. It just turns all that off. Uh, so then you can go ahead and just have your base colors um, and just take it in to whatever program you need to work on it next. Um, so this basic tools are exactly that. They're just some basic tools um, for uh, for the artist to use. Next, the material group select. So this is, uh, again, a time-saving thing uh, that you can turn off colors and, and materials you're not using so then Substance Designer isn't calculating them. So in this case, like we're not 
we're not using gold, we're not using, um, well, we're actually using the rest of those metals, um, cloths, we're actually using all the cloths, so in this case we can turn off one. In other cases, like a gun, you're not using any of the cloths, you know, you're not using skin or lips or eyes, you know, well, that's actually true in this case, we're not using uh, lips in this case, we could turn that off. So that's that. Next you have color select. So currently you see it says war paint white on. Uh, what this does, uh, oh, it's actually false right now, so it's actually off. So if we actually had colors selected, currently we have no colors selected, so we go ahead and add some colors real quick. Make her like bright blue, something fun. Um, uh, let's see, we use shiny paint. What else do I use on her? I use uh, dull paint. Eh, let's make it red. Why not? Let's just do a Superman look. Alright, so obviously this wouldn't be keeping it consistent. Um, if people are going around and using maybe a different color white and things like that. So there's an override. You go ahead and tap the override and it's going to give you one solid white that should be used on everything. Now in this case, speaking of limiting button uses uh, and th things like that, is I could actually take the color selection out of here. So then this is the white. That's all you get. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, actually let's leave it off for now. Let's just keep it as so you guys can see what artists at Red 5 look at when we actually are texturing uh, a character. Uh, is we're actually seeing this. this. Um, so that's color selection. So that, that goes for everything. The cloth, things like that. And I'm not going to go through to change all of it. Um, next is the War Paint Safety Tool. Uh, what this does is I piped everything through that is going to touch paint uh, a painted area because I have I had to separate things in certain ways and made sure that it'll turn it black and white. So that means if you have dirt splattered across this model, which we can do right now, let's go ahead and go down here and let's turn on dirt. So when we have dirt splattering across the model, um, instead of having to mask it out or just have it not be on a war painted surface, I can simply have it go away. So let's go ahead and turn this back to copy so you can see the color. And this helps keep you know a consistent look going across the model, um, so there's no jarring break or anything uh, crazy. So let this calculate. No, oh, probably opacity. That's the problem. So like I said, see how long it's taking now. Imagine before before I added time savings. It was it was fairly fairly bad. So you see here on the, on the edges we're getting orange and stuff on the actual war painted areas, and we don't want that. So if you come up here to war paint safety, go ahead and turn that on. And it's going to turn all that into black and white. On top of that, there's also a certain value range that we cannot exceed when it comes to war painted colors. Uh, that being anything above 50% gray. Um, so I also put an opacity so you can make dark dirt on like your metals and things like that and then just simply knock it back on the war painted areas. So that's just a simple little tool. Uh, again one of those tools that I created first made it very complex and then once I thought about it some more came back made it much more simple. Simpler went from 24 nodes to I think 6. Um, but as you guys just also saw is pick overlays. So here goes where everything that I was talking about happens. That big filter node that I was looking at or talking about earlier this is what it all comes down into. So first uh, thing that we looked at was the paint overlay. So here goes paint overlay. So we're going to go ahead and turn that on. And there you go. So there goes the basic paint overlay and the basic look of, of any accord based uh, character when it comes to the, the basic tooth and things like that. Uh, now this one does have a little bit of a crank 
cranked up roughness on it, and that's because of the, the beauty renders I was doing um, uh, for this character. Um, because once you colorize it, it changes things a little bit, so I had to, to tweak stuff. Um, so that's that tool, and like I said, you come into here, you know, like go into scale and say, okay, I want the scratches uh, to be bigger. So we go at, or smaller. Um, you want a lot of fine scratches, so we're going to go ahead and just divide it by two. And there you go, now you have much smaller scratches throughout the character. Um, gives you that little bit of fine tuning I was talking about that, that helps, uh, helps the artist uh, use this for different applications. Um, different texture sizes, things like that, you know. Uh, if I gave you one set scratches and you were working on something that was really, really small and it had these giant scratches, or these really small scratches, and it just would mess up your scale, well now you can scale up to scratches to help sell the scale. Um, you can continue down and basically, like, everything just creates a different type of effect. Um, you know, uh, edge paint damage, this is one of the first nodes I created. Um, uh, first masking nodes, uh, so this just does damage around around the character. Um, does the edge paint adds a little black border in there, and actually I made it so that black border um, to help show the thickness of the paint because we don't actually put normal map information in our edge damage um, unless you're actually taking damage. Uh, there's two different ways. Yeah, as your character takes damage, we have a thing called a damage map, and that will actually show normal map information. Um, is for each damage you turn on, so like paint damage 2, uh, if we turn this on, this is just basically a different algorithm uh, in case you're not getting the right edges that you wanted. Uh, you can go ahead and turn this one on um, to get a little bit more, but it's just going to add to that black line. You're not going to have uh, other things. Um, and then there's also like round edge wear, um, which was definitely a challenge and still quite not perfected, uh, but trying to get those rounder, larger surfaces and get damage on those. Um, in, in a very sporadic and, and random sense. Um, and all of these have full controls in them. Um, you know, we can make this character incredibly damaged. You know, we just up the, the spread and the levels. You know, we could up the warp a little bit. Let's have some fun. Calculating, calculating. There we go. Nope, nope. So there you go. So now we have an incredibly damaged character that's been through the thick of it. But just think of the power that alone makes. You know, if we need to do an NPC that's like heavily damaged, how quickly we can come in here and do iterations, um, find find ways to, uh, you know, add dirt and rust to these areas and just make a quick, quick texture over having to do it by hand and doing overlays and, you know, someone actually combining a Photoshop layer and then, you, you know, makes your job much more difficult to try to separate, you know, that back out. Well, in this case, you never have to worry about this because this process is completely undestructive. Uh, you're not going to, you're not going to collapse a layer on accident. Um, so this is basically the synopsis of, of, of what we did here. Um, we'd have the Accord template currently, the one that I'm showing now, uh, and then we also have the weapons one that we use for all the weapons. Um, hopefully you guys picked up something useful out of this and a way to use uh, Substance Designer in in your pipelines uh, or for your small projects or even just to create these template notes. Uh, it's actually quite enjoyable. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to uh, email me at uh, rich.steven01 at gmail.com. Um, happy to help anyone who has any questions about Substance Designer, uh, ways that we did things. Um, you know, hopefully I can help troubleshoot things. Um, thank you, Algorithmic. Thank you, Red 5 Studios. Uh, please go to firefall.com. Um, check it out. Go run through the game and, and see. Uh, see what substance designer things you can find and there's going to be plenty more to come as we start integrating every single one of these battle frames um, and character progressions into that system.